What if I told you there's a network of powerful mates who currently siphon off half Australia's potential wealth? If it wasn't for these mates, we could all be twice as well off. It's like you're working half your life for these mates for nothing. These mates share implicit favours to capture our wealth. They avoid paying taxes, they get government legislation written for them, and they skew industries across the country for their benefit. Mining, property, transportation, banking, health, education. They even have their hands on your mortgage and superannuation. In Australia alone, it all adds up to hundreds of billions of dollars taken out of your pocket. How do I know that? Believe it or not, I'm an economist and I specialise in the study of networks of favouritism. My name is Dr Cameron Murray and with my colleague, Professor Paul Friders, I've researched who is taking your money, how much they're taking and how they do it. We've turned our findings into a book, Game of Mates, where we take on the illegitimate and unethical but not necessarily illegal world of grey corruption. Welcome back to ESSA TV. You just heard Dr Cameron Murray of the University of Queensland give an overview of his new book, Game of Mates, How Favours Bleed the Nation. As Dr Murray mentioned, the book was co-authored by himself and Professor Paul Friders of the London School of Economics. Professor Friders joins us now from London to give a greater insight into the Game of Mates and detail how it's hurting your back pocket. Professor Friders, thank you very much for joining us today. Not at all. In simple terms, explain the concept of great corruption and how great gifts can be identified. So we're, we're talking about the classic economic issue of rent seeking and coalition formation, on which there are large literatures, and this is, as it were, um, a case study of how this may work in Australia. The central idea of grey gifts is that there are imperfect property rights in the economy in the sense that government at various levels, including councils, states and the Commonwealth, they give away um, lots of wealth including and income generating monopolies or rights to individuals via a whole variety of actions. And as soon as you give away via government action um, something that is of great value to others but that is unpriced, then what you're going to get, what you're going to get in each case is that you're going to get a group of individuals forming a coalition around this rent that you give out, uh, and they're going to make sure that the decision goes your way. So the classic example in property markets is that one of the gifts you give out as government is to say, here is when you could put high-rise buildings, there you cannot. Now that is worth something to the person who holds the land at that moment. Suddenly they can do more with it. So you've just given tens of millions away to someone. And you may have in mind that you do this because of bureaucratic reasons, but the reality is you're giving away tens of millions of dollars. And as soon as you do that, but you haven't priced it, then what you're going to, what you have given away is a grey gift. And around that, you're going to get grey corruption. And we illustrate the workings of the grey gifts throughout the Australian economy. Uh, and it's always the same pattern, which is that government in some form is giving out a large right or a guarantee and you have coalition formation to make sure it goes to the mates. So the game of mates is this game of grabbing the grey gifts that governments give out at various levels to keep within a very small group, uh, which goes to the detriment of our society as a whole. In simple terms, can you explain the game of mates, including its four main elements, and why it's so important for the Australian public to be aware of it. So, putting your mind's eye this notion that there is hence, as it were, a, a pot of money or a pot of honey that is given out by some level of government. Then in the ideal world, the person doing this in government, you know, is well-meaning and, uh, and is an elected official who's full of idealism and, and as it were, uh, goes on the advice of his own ministry and hands out this gift to someone totally unexpecting in the population who's the most deserving, you know, the area where you want to have rezoned, the person who would make in principle the best banker, the best place to have a university, to build the bridge where it should be. There are hundreds and hundreds of such examples of how it should be. Now what happens more in reality over time is that this pot of money, um, the, the person giving it is co-opted in a long-run game 
with the people that they are giving it to. Uh, and so a whole industry emerges that becomes interested in making sure that the person who gives out the great gift is one of them and makes this decision under the anticipation that later on they're going to be given a job or they're going to be part of the mates that the gift has been given to. So there is a great gift, that is number one. But two is this mateship that there is between the person giving out the gift and the people who uh, are, are benefiting from this gift. And so this wouldn't work if the gift is just given once in a 100 years. But if it's recurrent and if it's in a major area and people can somewhat anticipate this gift is being given, then, as it were, a whole coalition can form around it. So the second notion is this notion of gifts, whereby uh, if you are the, the, the policymaker giving away the gifts and, and I happen to want to be the recipient, then I make sure we're friends. You know, you're married to my sister, maybe, or, uh, or, or else you are a, a co-owner of the firm that you are, in fact, uh, going to give a, a gift to, or you used to be a director, but now you're a politician, so you've gone into politician to do the right thing by us, right? And so you're already a mate. There is a great gift. And um, the third element of this is that um, uh, there is um, uh, a cloak of myths in it, which is that in order to sell the fact that you're in fact giving me and not other people this grey gift, you bullshit a little bit, right? You're going to say, ah, oh, this is in fact all for the best. Paul is the most deserving. No, we've done this purely because of bureaucratic reasons. Look, he follows all the all the, all the rules and regulations. Uh, that you could possibly want to have um, in this kind of area, right? And the third, uh, the fourth element would be how did you and I meet, right? How can you and I trust each other? And the way that you and I can trust each other is because we've we've given each other gifts in the past and we've signaled to each other, you know, you do me a little favor, you know, get me a job here or get someone in my family a job, I do you a little favor. But to really cement our relationship, we need mutual dirt together, which is we need something on which both you and I can blackmail each other. So, you know, we've got a video of the last time we went to Hawaii together. Or, in fact, we both know how we screwed over one of the previous companies that was a competitor. And we, we, we know, as it were, the half criminal way that we did it, but only you and I know. So now we can blackmail each other. So that is the burning money. Uh, mutual dirt element in how we actually got to have such a strong relationship. It works if you and I, for our mateship, if you and I are in fact a little bit criminal, but only you and I know about it. Those are the four elements. Does the game of mates bear any resemblance to the mafia? It it does. So the, 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 there is one large difference so far in, in the way that the mafia works and game of mate works in Australia, which is that we we haven't found much evidence that a lot of it is very violent. So with a with a true mafia, if somebody's in the way, they just shoot them. Uh, that level has not yet been reached in Australia. There there are a, a string of, of of people who have been so bullied by uh, local mates that they they committed suicide. Um, and uh, Rob Pine's people have, have sort of been uncovering some of that in Queensland, but it's not yet truly violent. So that is where the difference is. Um, but otherwise, it, it looks like local mafiosi uh, in all but name, but oriented around, hence, these pots of money given out. Each pot of money has its own mafia, if you like, right? Um, and so it's not like a giant coalition of all our elites. It's not like they get together, with, you know, a thousand in one room. No, no. As it were, one pot of money, one little mafia. Uh, and it, it works very much like that, right? There are people who get much more out of this game than others. Uh, there are the people who, who bring out the mythology to the rest of the population, then the, the hopeful young guns who are trying to get into this little mafia and try to do little dirty jobs for their masters and others who are talking about how great this mafia is for the rest of the world and how it will help Australia. And so it, it works very much like uh, a crime syndicate in, in, in all but in the violent sense of the word. So if this game does not get opposed, there, yeah, one, one should expect the game to get violent at some point. In the book, you touch on international tax avoidance, which costs Australia anywhere from 6 to $50 billion a year. The government is currently promoting its new corporate tax laws, with TV ads and the tagline, Earned Here, Taxed Here. Will these new measures ensure a significant fall in lost tax revenue, or will the mates, in this case large multinational firms, continue to pay little to no tax?
I don't actually know the nitty gritty of what is being proposed, uh, but I would be astounded if the new laws work. So I would I would be totally astounded if new laws work, and that is for the simple reason that this is this tax avoidance business by large companies is a problem all over the Western world. Um, I wouldn't even say it's a bigger problem in Australia than elsewhere, right? Um, so it's a huge problem in the States, it's a huge problem in Europe, uh, and it's highly tricky. Um, and the reason that it's highly tricky is that with international firms, they have so many opportunities of, as it were, hiding their costs and profits elsewhere in the world. So if you really want to, to upset the game that international corporations play in terms of um, uh, in bureaucratic accounting terms, having their profit uh, made somewhere else, um, then you're going to have to read all kinds of international tax treaties. You're going to have to undo, I would think, a lot of bilateral trade agreements where a lot of these things are sewn up. Uh, and so I doubt that whatever they have in mind is going to work. But look, you know, one, one should be a tax expert and look very carefully at what is being proposed. Um, but uh, I, I do see mechanisms for undoing this kind of tax uh, tax avoidance. But I don't think this is the right place to talk about it. But I think it's a, it's a really tough one that will will take many years still to crystallize in terms of how to do it. I, I think the best way to go, um, if we're going to talk about solutions, is the way that the Americans have gone with some of the European firms, and the European firms are now going with some of the American firms, which is just to find them shitloads of money. So effectively, you tell them, look, we don't like you. You've done this wrong. Pay us so many billions. And that is an effective form of taxation. So this is what the Obama regime did with uh, BP. Remember this Deepwater Horizon scandal, which was in fact uh, an American firm. They went after British Petroleum anyway, and they got something like 20 billion out of them. Uh, and so that is the way you can tax. You can basically just send them a bill. Um, not even pretend it's because of any activities there anywhere. You can just send them a bill. They say real estate is about location, location, location. But it's not. Land values are also determined by governments using a system of rules and regulations. If the rules say your land can only be used for houses, you can't build a 10-storey apartment building. But if the rules change, then you can. Influencing valuable government decisions like these are what the Game of Mates is all about. I ran an analysis of six locations in southeast Queensland where new rules for property development resulted in a gift worth $710 million. 70% of that $710 million was gifted to a tiny group of people. This tiny group of people are socially and politically well connected. They work in each other's companies and are directors on each other's boards. They signal their intentions by donating to both big political parties. They employ former politicians to lobby for them, and their former employees take key positions in government bodies. It's hard to believe, but none of this is currently illegal, and it's worth about $11 billion a year in increased land value. But it doesn't have to be like this. In the ACT, when land rules change in your favour, you pay the government 75% of the value gained. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, they auction these rule changes to the highest bidder. The government makes an equivalent of $200 million a year. We know the solutions. We just need the courage to take on the mates. Can you go into more detail about the land titles and zoning systems in the ACT and whether they should be adopted nationwide? The principle of, of rezoning is that you cannot just put, let's say, a chemical plant next to a school. Uh, so you are restricted in the sense of what you can build somewhere. Uh, it's got to be, as it were, a state or a council plan that says, yes, you can build what you want to build in a certain place. So not just can't you build a chemical plant next to a school, you can't just put a skyscraper uh, on a place that's supposed to be agricultural. Um, 
uh, or a place that only otherwise has low level residential uh, areas because you take the shade of other people, but also uh, as soon as you put up a high rise building, you've got to build a road there and water and electricity. So the first thing is you should realize that there's actually a reasonably good reason why you have such a thing as rezoning, right? Rezoning is there for, as it were, efficiencies in the, in the urban system and public sector um, uh, amenities that are brought there. So what you can build somewhere goes according to a plan. Um, and then in, in, in the whole of the country, these plans can change, right? And they can change, uh, and there are all kinds of bureaucratic procedures for it, but these bureaucratic procedures can be gamed in the sense of the people on these committees and the push uh, because eventually these things are decided by politicians. And so I would, I would even say at, at many local levels, that's how you should understand the political parties. The political parties are, are to a large extent gangs of property developers. And they belong to either both political parties or one or two of the political parties. That's where a lot of the main political game is to get their hands on this rezoning and also exemptions of rezoning plans or heritage plans or, or whatever the restriction is to adding uh, different layers to it. Now, in the ACT, what they do is, is quite interesting. In the ACT, um, you can, as it were, buy uh, rezoning decisions to some extent, which is that if you want to improve your dwelling, which is hence you, you build extra on it or you replace it by a higher building, then an assessment is made as to how much extra your, your property is going to be worth. Uh, and they say, well, you're going to pay three quarters of that additional worth up front. And furthermore, if you don't then actually make the improvement after two years, well, the option stops. So if you don't actually then do it within two years, you can't even do it anymore. So this gives you an incentive to actually go out and make that improvement that you said you were going to do because you paid three quarters of the worth of that improvement already beforehand. And this ACT system works wonderfully in two ways. A, it makes the government a lot of money, which is hence foregone in the rest of the country. And we calculate that it's probably around $11 billion a year that the rest of the country foregoes. Another way of saying that is that corruption is $11 billion in the rest of the country per year, right? Uh, that, that they hence have in this game, which is an enormous amount, which is hence why it drives so much of local politics. Um, and the second thing is that there's no waiting in the ACT, you know. There's no land banking, there's no, oh, I'm holding all this land and I'm going to build properties later to make extra profit, which is what happens in the rest of Australia as well. So it speeds up property development in the ACT. So in that sense, growth and development are deliberately kept back in many of the urban areas of Australia, precisely because money can be made by withholding uh, the glut of supply uh, and hence keeping prices artificially high. So it's also uh, an affordability issue. There, there's a deliberately unaffordability uh, element to, uh, to to not having this, this betterment tax on it. It's easy to see how you can redo it, right? You can go towards the ACT system almost overnight in the other states because administratively speaking, the systems are very, very close. You you don't need to go to, to leaseholding or, or to sort of, you know, uh, government held things that are then on loan. You, you don't actually have to do any of that. Given the political connectedness of the mates, is it feasible that the ACT's practices could be adopted nationwide in the future? Look, Australia is a functioning democracy, right? For all the criticisms that we have of the immense amount of corruption that is now normal in Australia, it is a functioning democracy, right? It is relatively low violent. Uh, there is a compulsory voting, which means that at least something what 90% actually has a vote. And there's also competition in the political sphere. So as soon as the political will is there, as soon as the population realizes how much they're being um, fleeced, really, via uh, all kinds of cuts to them, and how much their life could, as it were, be better, fairer, uh, and easier if, uh, if, if, if they went against this tide, then... I think this could be done very, very quickly, but it needs the political will. It needs, it needs the population to realize what is going on. Many of us suspect that the game of mates is on the rise. And the Australian Research Council put over $200,000 into a research study led by Professor Paul Friders. In nearly all the areas uh, of regular economic life that we've looked at here in Australia, you find the same pattern, that in terms of the money coming in to people, 
A lot of it is siphoned off via this game. And uh, in terms of the money going out, you easily pay twice as much as you should. Uh, take an example. The biggest purchase you probably will make in your life is your house. Um, but you effectively pay for it by having a mortgage with the bank. Now every year in this country, you will have paid about one to 2% more on your mortgage than you would have done in another country. Now one to 2% a year doesn't sound much, but one to 2% a year every year means after two years, you've paid two to 4% too much. After 10 years, you've paid 20 to 40% too much. And before you've actually given back the money from your mortgage, you've easily paid twice as much. The game has evolved into a, a very invisible set of relationships whereby everything that you pay for, you pay too much. Everything that we're, we're coming in, a cut has been taken off. And you easily, hence, indeed, end up twice as poor as you could be. So another big industry is in infrastructure, road building, tunnels, bridges. And it seems to me like Australia does pretty well. We have a lot of nice new transport infrastructure. So, so help me see what's going on with the game of mates there. Well, the first thing to ask yourself with a lot of new infrastructure is who owns it? Those turn out to be often private companies, private individuals, private entities. But if you didn't ask the question, well, who's actually paid for it? The answer is surprisingly often, the public has paid for it. And hence, these roads, these bridges, these tunnels are effectively given to private enterprises in a little uh, game of mates between the politicians, the top bureaucrats, and these, these particular uh, transport companies. Um, and there are various accounting tricks that they've basically used. If you, for instance, guarantee people a 15% return on a particular amount of, uh, uh, of investment, uh, that, <laughs> that is like giving gold to individuals. We end up paying for its construction. They run no risks at all. We even want to start to do this with schools and hospitals, which hence are also, as it were, at risk of being taken over by private entities, whereas we, the public, have paid for it. And it's just, just a, a direct theft, as far as I'm concerned, of public assets. If politicians and bureaucrats are giving out favors worth billions, hundreds of millions, then uh, it should be sold off. It should be clear who is getting that favor and what they're paying for it. If they're not paying for it, and if it's not clear, then you can almost bet your bottom dollar that some bunch of insiders is taking it for their benefit and you're not getting a part of that, uh, that pie. I find it quite stunning, really, how, uh, how many of our former top politicians now find it completely normal to spend the twilight of their career uh, organizing lobbying activities and sort of robbing the rest of us. Australia sounds like it's uh, the game of mates is penetrating every corner. Are we really that bad? Well, I think it's gotten a lot worse the last 15 years in Australia, most definitely. You see this in the widening inequality in Australia. This used to be a very equal country, now it's become a very unequal country. But I, I wouldn't say it's the worst country in the world. I think that in America, you've had uh, similar things going on. It's partly why Trump has been so popular, with lots of people who feel they've lost out and that the special interests are running Washington. Drain the swamp was the, uh, was the saying. Uh, it's of course not clear that Trump is going to do this at all. Um, but I think apart from America, I, I would be hard pressed to name another Western country where things are as bad as, as they are here. Can you explain how the game of mates works with regards to superannuation? So there is large diversity across the world as to pension systems. Uh, and we compared Australia to world best and what we thought was world best were the systems in the Netherlands and Denmark where they have a state run pension system. Um, particularly for civil servants, but also for large swathes of the rest of the economy, where hence um, you and I would save a fixed percentage of our income towards our retirement, but this is in a common fund. And the advantage of a common fund is that the overhead costs are very, very low, uh, in the order of 0.1% per year, which means that if we start, uh, of, of the money that we save when we're, say, let's say 25, by the time we're 65, there is still something like 97% left, right? So it, it sort of doesn't matter much, the overhead of every dollar that's there, plus, of course, whatever the benefits have been of the investment. Now, in Australia, it's done differently. In Australia, the way it's done is that in, in each industry, in, in principle, you have employers and employee representatives, i.e. the unions, who get together and say, well, 
which of the funds shall we recommend? Shall we give as a list to our members in this industry or the workers um, to, to be a part of? And do you see the pattern coming? There's a great gift there happening, right? What are they going to recommend? What is going to be the industry default super fund? Well, and there is where the gray gift emerges. So what has happened in many of these industries is that the employers and the union bosses have gotten together and run this super fund themselves, sometimes own it as well. Uh, and guess what happens then to the overheads? The overheads are no longer 0.1% every year. They're more like 1%, 1.5%, sometimes 2% a year. Now, it doesn't sound much, does it, 1.5% a year, but don't forget, if you pay 1.5% when you're 25, you pay another 1.5% when you're 26, another 1.5% when you're 27. So by the time you get to 65, of any dollar that you put in when you were 25, if it's 1.5%, ooh, there's not much more left than, what, 30 cents, something like that, right? 70 cents has been tacked away, taxed away by the mates. Um, and this hence goes via this system of employers and employee representatives putting a set of, of super funds in front of their members' eyes. Well, you can choose between these. Um, that is hence when you, you leave the world of perfect competition, you leave the world of, of clear choice, really, because the choice is constrained by what's put in you and you have a huge amount of financial um uh, information that you cannot possibly digest on these funds, so you're going to go with what you're recommended, and that is where they get you as a member. Uh, and the, the rest is just a straightforward stitch up. So, will they mandate the super fund as, as a direct alternative, which is uh, a new government super fund, uh, which would hence mean that gradually it would start to attract most of the pension payments in the country. Given the compulsory nature of superannuation, and while we wait for a government fund to be established, how can individuals go about maximising their savings for retirement? Maximising their savings for retirement, how do you do that? Well, making more income helps, of course, if you want to maximise your savings. <laughs> uh, I mean, there is still some diversity in the super funds that you may have, uh, have access to. Um, Organizing it yourself, there are usually lots of hidden fees and there are lots of disincentives to do that because these super funds hate that sort of thing. So they try and make that difficult in many ways that you cannot quite see beforehand. Um, I would say, it's, yeah, if you want to maximize it without starting a revolution, well, you could go to particular industries where the super funds in those industries have less overheads than in other industries. So in some industries, Life has gotten so bad that they, they have managed to mandate that everybody should use the industry super fund. And hence, you don't even have any other choice but to go with whatever the union bosses and the employers have, have cobbled up together, in which case, of course, the overheads are even larger. Um, and so if you have the choice of different industries to work for, you can, you, you can have a look at what the overheads of the super funds are. And, uh, and, and, and sort of walk away from the most expensive stitch up. Great gifts are everywhere, but we've dealt with them in some areas. In international sport, match referees control the game's rules and regulations. So we appoint referees from countries without a stake in the outcome. We could also use international experts when deciding on new transport infrastructure. In courts, juries are drawn randomly from the public to ensure they can't trade in grey gifts. We could appoint juries from the public to scrutinise recruitment decisions at the top of government departments. If you can't appoint a jury or an international expert, the most simple thing of all is to price grey gifts. Sell them or tax them. It removes the temptation for groups of mates to form around them and capture all the gains for themselves. And that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Can increased regulation and transparency limit the influence of the mates and ensure the public get a better deal? I think in general the answer to that is the opposite. I think that it's not about increased transparency, although in some cases that may help a little bit. But in many cases, it wouldn't help at all. We, we know perfectly well what's going on in mining, in superannuation, in banking. There are all kinds of reviews, there are all kinds of reports which say how things should be done. So. I think that transparency is, is by and large not, not really going to give you all that much. Uh, and I think the same is true for more regulation. More regulation is this control reflex, you know, let's write more rules. No, no, 
You don't want to have more bureaucratic rules in which you have to trust a bureaucrat to do the right thing. That's that's the attitude which got us into the mess we're into now. The problem is that the bureaucrat or the politician you have to trust starts to become one of the mates. The mates immediately orient themselves towards this new bureaucrat, the new regulator. And they are going to be the person they play. And furthermore, that new regulator is likely to be one of the mates. Because guess who appoints that new regulator, right? So more regulation and this whole control reflex, which, uh, which is very strong in Australia, is exactly the attitude that got you into this mess. So no, what, what you need to do is to take the grey gifts off the table. That is the big thing. Take back the money off the table. So also reclaim some of the value of the grey gifts that have been taken out of the economy and are now in the hands of, of the mates. So you, you can, as it were, ex post tax them. You can basically say, oh, sorry, we shouldn't have given that away. That was done in a way we now consider improper and illegal. We're going to tax you for this. So you, you can take back the money from the past. Um, and you can't just do that. With, with the when the political will is there, you cannot undo the mistakes of the past. Um, and the second thing is that you can, you can take back the great gifts and basically uh, work out systems of taxing them. And there are different ways of taxing them in each sector, and apart from taking away the great gifts, in some sectors you can also do other things, like set up a default uh, government superannuation scheme, which is hence not more regulation, it's just setting up an actual entity. Um, in the case of the ACT, it's hence not more regulation, it's different regulation. Right? There are regulations in other states, but the ACT regulatory system is in some sense much simpler. Uh, and, and also much more efficient, but it hence means a different type of regulation. And the, the key bit is there that you've taken back the great gifts in, in, in the hands of the government, but explicitly with the notion that, oh, we're going to actually make people pay for these great gifts. You've just run through some proposed solutions to the game. Do you prefer one solution over the others, or does the optimal solution usually depend on the industry it would be applied to? Yes, it depends very much on the system, uh, on the sector where you're, you're looking at uh, the deployment. So in superannuation, I really cannot see much else work but uh, a national superannuation fund. Right? I, I don't think that any tinkering you can do with private funds or, or even trying to make private funds pay for the privilege of doing the superannuation, I think that's a fairly hopeless thing. It's too hard. Um, and it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and particularly transparency, I think that's that's a, a total dead duck in superannuation. If you really want transparency in superannuation, you can get it, but you're still nowhere. I mean, figure this out yourself. If your superannuation firm would send you 2,000 pages every month as to updated rules on the superannuation scheme and they're keeping you informed, would you read them? Would you know the choice that you're there making? No, you can't. And so you want full transparency with superannuation, you're going to get it, and it's going to get you nowhere. <laughs> so, so there, the transparency, and even trying to take back the, uh, uh, or, or trying to uh, tax the gifts that are still in private hands is, I think, hopeless, and the only way to go really is a, a national competitor. But that certainly would not be true for mining, uh, and it wouldn't be true for property markets either. You you don't necessarily need the government involved in construction uh, of all these properties. In fact, there's not much money in construction. It's all about the right to rezone. That's where the money is. Um, and so there, what you basically want is to charge up front like they do in the ACT. So yes, it's sector specific. Australia used to pride itself on being the land of the fair go. Now, it's a game of mates. What the future holds is up to us.